Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode eight of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Derek Robbins, a man dedicated to helping professionals achieve success by living with purpose in life and in business. But before we get into that conversation, Sean, how about a little bit of humor to get started? All right, Chris, there's going to be a huge tone of motivation in our talk today with Jarek Robbins. I'm very excited. But first, whatever you do, always give 100% unless you're donating blood. <laughs> Good stuff. So with that, why don't we introduce Mr. Jarek Robbins? Absolutely. At age 23, Jarek was awarded the Congressional Medal from the United States Congress. He's conducted trainings for a variety of companies and organizations, including the U.S. Marines and Air Force, BMW, Remax, UBS, and the U.S. Olympic team. He's a trusted advisor and board member to a variety of different companies and has founded two of his own. Today, with over a decade of performance coaching experience, continues to unlock secrets for maximizing performance and organizational success. As an innovator, Jarek is applying his own philosophy in living a life of adventure, philanthropy, and entrepreneurship. But Jarek does more than just talk about it. He stretches the boundaries of traditional thinking and makes it happen. So with that, let's jump right in. Jarek, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Good to be here. So you, uh, you help people find their purpose and help them create success through that. What is that for you and what does that look like? Sure. It's really simple. Um, the, the whole concept of, of our main focus has always been helping people maximize their personal and professional performance. So when we look at individuals, a lot of times we get busy entrepreneurs who have a million and one hats to wear, who've got a million and one things to do, and there's not enough time to do it. And so we're pretty granular in how we work with people. We usually work very specifically with, with helping track the most critical KPIs they have in their life, their health, their fitness, their emotions, their relationships, their finances, their business, spirituality, stuff like that. And, and we track measure it, you know, every single Single day, we track and measure what they're doing, how they're doing it, and we help them figure out what's the difference between a high performance day and a low performance day. And, and then we track that. And in tracking that, it allows us to get hard metrics on how they're actually performing day to day in their life. And it also gives me the fact that I could jump in and send them, you know, a high five when it's going well and a WTF when it's not going well and get them back on track. So most people, you might be able to have a bad day, a bad month, about bad year. Uh, we make sure it's no more than 24 hours at a time before we kick you in the pants and get you right back on track. So that's where we focus as far as a day job is concerned. Um, Achieving success by living with purpose, th there's a concept here, and it's somewhere a blend between Tony Robbins and Richard Branson. And as a small business owner, you could be someone who's more like the first person, which is a performance-based, you know, go, 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 more, 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 bigger, 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 better, 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 never ending. You work 24-7. You're up at 4 in the morning. You go to bed at 2 in the morning, and somehow you make it all work and always are achieving more. And you get to get phenomenal results in the process. And so that's your MO. That's how you do it. That is success to you. And you want to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year with a couple breaks every now and then. But on your break, you're still thinking about work and your passion and your purpose. Or – you might be the other type of entrepreneur, which is you're a lifestyle-based entrepreneur, and you're the type of person that's like, hey, I love what I do, and if I could do it from a hammock and a beach, it would be so much better. And, and you know, I don't mind having 300 companies with 100,000 employees as long as I can be sitting on a hammock you know, in a beach doing great mm -hmm. stuff, relaxing and enjoying it. And yeah, I'll whip up a meal a day for the ones I love and it'll be exclusive to get there and it'll be very high price to hang out with me, but that's how I want to live my life. And uh, people tend to think one is right or wrong. One is better or worse. One is a good thing or a bad thing. And so, you know, before we were talking, you had mentioned most people generally follow a certain pattern. So they follow a pattern that says you're supposed to go to school, get a degree, get a job, work really hard, save your money, and someday you'll have enough money that you can then stop working and finally get to do all the stuff you've dreamed of doing in your life. And at that point, you are successful and good luck. Hopefully you don't die too soon. That's what yep. we've been taught. And hopefully you had your two and a half kids along the way. You got a white picket fence and live in a cool house somewhere in a suburb. That thought and concept existed. And, and I think at the way times are changing right now, that is a very outdated concept. It's still a beautiful dream for many, many people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, if that's what they want, 
we can help them get there. We help them increase their performance, measure, track, and improve, and boom, we can get there faster than they could probably do on their own. If that's not the dream, if you're someone who has this weird inkling in your nervous system that's like, you know, I don't think that's what I want. I've always wanted to beat to my own drum, carve my own path, create my own way. And I don't want to have to show up and do what someone else tells me to do any longer. If you're willing to pay the price and, and make a little bit of a sacrifice, you know, Richard Branson, as much as he's hanging out on a hammock now, he sure as heck didn't start there. It wasn't like, oh, let me break out my journal and go sit on the hammock and boom, Virgin Airlines took off. That's not where it came from. It was close, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he saw opportunity. He took advantage of it. He stepped in. He delivered value and he worked his face off to get that value to actually turn into a gigantic monster of a Goliath business it is today. And now he gets the reward of it. So yes, you still have to put in the hard work and the grind and the hours and effort and time. You just have a different outcome of what you're headed towards. Instead of heading towards more, 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 you're headed towards, I'm going to get to this place where I'm, I do what I love. Notice he didn't start a uh, virgin dumpster picking up company. Like he didn't start virgin computer making company. He didn't start any of this stuff. He started stuff he was interested in flying records, music, uh, cell phones somehow. But I think the other, you know, the ones he started with are more interesting for him. He started stuff that was his passion, something he loved, something was purpose filled, something that really truly lit him on fire. And so our goal is to align people with what their passion is real quick for anyone listening to give you tactical stuff instead of just a broad conversation. Uh, if you, if you're trying to figure out what the heck that is, there's four questions. Number one, what does the world need more of right now? Just make a list. What does the world need more of? Number two, what do you love to do? Like, what would you pay to go do every day? Like, what do you actually love to do? Number three, cause it's not always the same. What are you actually good at? Cause sometimes people love to sing and the God honest truth is they ain't that good at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're like, you shouldn't be doing that yet. Practice more and then go try to make it a business. Or it can be uh, a hobby. Or a hobby. Just just sing in the shower. It's great. Do it because you love it. But you, you got to find the correlation between what the world needs, what you love to do, what you're actually good at or talented at. And the final thing is what are they what are people willing to pay for? And like whenever he, I do like this, guy. exactly. Icky guy. There you go. That concept, and if you want to know and you're trying to find what's that passion, what's that purpose, how do I achieve success by living with purpose, it, it's aligning this concept. The other piece that goes with it is defining what your absolute ideal day is. It's something we talk about in our book, and it's something along the lines of you never know when that last day might be. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he was like, hey, I just found out some girl I went to high school with just literally flashed, had a heart attack and died the other day. It's like, holy mackerel. I'm like, how old was she? 40. She have any kids? No, she was married though. And it's like, wow, I know she always wanted kids, but not anymore. Like she's gone. Mm -hmm. It's like, holy hell. Like no one thought that was coming, obviously. And you don't know if that's tomorrow for you or next week or next Thursday or whenever. And, and so the concept of, are you living the type of day that no matter how famous or rich or much money you make or anything like that, the type of day that's so rich, so fulfilling, so full, that if that's the only day you got, nothing else would really matter. Like you could die with a smile on your face. I, I swiped something from a friend of mine, Brennan Burchard, in his book. He said, at the end of our lives, we're all faced with three questions. You know, when life gave you a chance to live, did you really live? Did you squeeze the juice out of life? Number two, uh, when life gave you a chance to love, did you pour every ounce of your heart and soul into that person or moment and purely every ounce of your heart and soul there? And number three, when life gave you a chance to make a difference, did you really matter? Did you show up in a way and did you deliver who you were in a way that long beyond this moment of time, you will truly matter and your ripple will continue far beyond the day when you're physically here? Uh, now, now, Jarek, you had mentioned uh, a story where that young lady passed and I watched your Ted talk where you had a pretty scary moment in time with yourself. So you're obviously extremely passionate about this topic, extremely passionate about helping people. You are seizing the moment each and every day. Where do you personally get your inspiration from, especially on those days when you're just not feeling it? 
it, it, it's simple little daily habits and patterns. So there was a great book called The Power of Habit written by Charles Duhigg. And he talks about the concept of how they were able to build habits and patterns at a local level, meaning individually, but also as a you know countrywide level of how they taught the entire United States how to brush their teeth and got them to brush their teeth every day. When tooth decay was the number one reason that people were failing to get into the armed services at the time. And they were like, wow, tooth decay is a problem. We need to convince the entire population of this country to brush their teeth every day and make it normal and standard, which nowadays, hopefully it is. Um, for most of us, uh, but still a few that, that catch my attention every now and then, but most of us, it's normal. And the whole concept of how the heck did they train the entire country to do something? And they broke it down into three simple steps, which is a cue, a routine and a reward, figure out what the cue is, figure out a routine to go through and give yourself an emotional reward. And there's, they, they talk about it in detail in that book, but that's as simple as it gets. Now from there, what are the habits you need to build into your day to get yourself to be at your best so that it's not up to hope or chance or life or the world or your your spouse or anything? Like it really truly is up to you if you do these certain things. And so I've always said to, to let people decide for themselves to start. Number one, I'd ask you, what's one habit you know that if you stopped today your life would be better because of that. Like you would be happier, you'd be healthier, you'd be more fulfilled, you'd make more money if there was one freaking habit you could cut out of your dang life. Number two, what's one habit that if you added into your life, you know you'd be happier, healthier, more fulfilled, making more money and more successful overall. And most people are smart enough that they know what the heck they need to be doing differently. I've never been in a room that I asked the question. People are like, huh, I don't know. It's like most people are like, well, I should really stop doing X. And you're like, yeah, okay, Sherlock, let's do it. And then, oh, and I should probably start doing Y. It's like, oh, there you go, genius. I'm glad we figured it out. It's pretty simple. Um, but then the key becomes how do you actually get yourself to do it? And that goes back to go grab that book, uh, you know, Power Habit by Charles Duhigg and read about it and practice it. And so some of the habits of how that get me to my best self, and I figured out these are different for everybody, but we offer tons of them as samples for people to kind of pick and choose from, smorgasbord per se. Uh, one thing, I have a morning routine, something I do every single morning, not like do not miss. I don't care if I have a 4 a.m. flight. I'm doing segments of this every morning to get myself to my best self. And, and some of that involves a crazy Icelander guy named Wim Hof who lives up in Amsterdam. Uh, this dude swims under icebergs, holding his breath, just wearing a pair of shorts. He runs above the free zone up in the Arctic, you know, a full marathon in just a pair of shorts. He hiked past the no-go zone in, in um, what is it, Everest, wearing just shorts, nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's amazing. He has the world record for being packed in ice for the longest amount of time. And it's, he's insane. So I learned from him, there's a very specific breathing technique you do that, that initiates adrenaline being released in your body, yet calms yourself at the same time, which according to my friend who, reads the, uh, who runs a neuroscience lab at Stanford, it creates some level of super performance, meaning you get all the side effects of the adrenaline release without any of the negative uh, bad stuff there. So you're all the great stuff, meaning your heart goes faster, your, your body burns sugar faster or fuel better. Um, you're more, you can see better, you can move quicker, all the great stuff that pops in. So the breathing techniques, number two, meditation techniques. There's a great company called Choose Muse we use. Um, for all those people who don't like meditation, I always thought I was meditating great when I would just sit silent and talk to myself for 20 minutes. Um, truth is, I would just have a wild conversation and I called it meditation and it really didn't help. So there's this cool little headband you throw on your head and literally it tells you how well you're actually doing it and gives you feedback auditorily where it's like sweet birds chirping and like the beautiful beach sound if you're doing it right. And if you start to screw up, it's like lightning and thunder and craziness to tell you that you got thoughts in your head. Very so cool. so I've you know trained the breath, trained the brain and then work out. During the workout, I have a treadmill desk here in my office, uh, vision boards up. And th th those kind of quasi science, to be honest, the vision board stuff. But my thought is, hey, if it's working, keep doing it. If it's not, get rid of it. And this one works for me. So I have images and pictures and, and visual you know, anchors of all the things I want to achieve. And while I'm walking, 
um, I'll, I'll visualize and speak out loud my 10 year vision for my life, my five year vision for my life, my one year vision for my life. Uh, then I'll switch to goals. So from a North star, which is something that's guiding the journey, which is my vision to the goals, tangible things I'm going to actually achieve and benchmarks I can measure up against. So 12 month goals, six month goals, this month goals, my weekly goals, daily goals, and then get to work. And what's interesting by the end of all of that, I'm on fire emotionally as a human being. Yeah. So it, it, it sounds like a lot of it comes back to, to habits and you know, the Charles Duhigg book, a uh, great book. I'm curious to see how that ties in. I, I, it seems like pretty well with you and, and your book, live it. You talk about, you know, emotional stacking and how we have, these we're either trying to create more pleasure through something or we're trying to avoid pain and going one way or the other helps us to make decisions. Can you kind of talk through that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. The example I've grown up hearing over and over and over again is what would you work harder to do to get a million dollars, to earn a million dollars or to keep someone from stealing your million dollars? most people will do more to keep you from stealing it than they will to go yeah. get it. <laughs> I can see that. Absolutely. Yeah. And you scratch your head. You're like, why? Like, like if, if you're, if you're driven to go get it, just go get another one. If someone steals it, who cares? But once we have it, we have this weird association. That's like, don't take my stuff. And we freak out if, if pain, it's painful if someone tries to steal it from us because now it was ours and we've lost it. And so the same thing goes in life. And, and so what's interesting is that painful consequence is more painful than, than having it versus most people. The reason you don't have a million bucks right now is in your mind. It's more painful to go through the process to get there than it is to just stay where you are. Otherwise you'd have 10 million bucks if it was that easy, but because it's a little hard, because it takes a lot of effort, because it takes a lot of time, because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of thought. Most people are like, eh, I'm doing okay. You know, that's for those people. And, and people who link up being in so much pain to where they are right now and a million dollars they think is the answer because it's more painful to stay where you are right now, they will charge forward and go find a way to get that million dollars to get out of their pain. So depending on where you mentally and emotionally place pain in your life, a lot of times will determine what you do and don't do. So one little secret you can apply is – Pick the things you want to stop doing and link up a lot of emotional pain to them and pick the stuff you want to start doing and link up a lot of emotional pleasure to it. Now, easy way to do that. If you think about, you know, classical and conditioning and in marketing, how they do it to us, go watch a TV commercial. You know, they show you if you're a guy, this would be stimulating or if, if you like girls either way. But, but if you see, let's say a Budweiser commercial and you see, you know, this person standing in a room with lots of good looking people around them, who's very popular, who drives up in a fancy car, who has access to all the amazing stuff. And then what are they holding in their hand? Budweiser. <laughs> Now, if they show you that enough times, pretty soon, you're, I don't drink at all. But if I saw that every day, I'd be like, damn, a Budweiser is probably the secret to life, it looks like, because they're getting you very excited and then showing you their product, getting you very excited, showing you their product. Pretty soon, you think the reason you're excited is because of their product, and you link up good emotions to it. Now, hopefully, you do this with your goals every day. Hopefully, every morning you wake up, you get really excited. You bounce on a rebounder. NASA says it's one of the best exercises in the world. It's a mini trampoline. So you bounce on your mini trampoline. You play your favorite music. You do your happy dance. And boom, you stare at your goals and say them out loud. Then you repeat the process again and again and again until pretty soon you think about your goals and you are wildly, passionately excited and pumped up for no good reason. And for the stuff that you don't want in your life, hopefully you purposely put yourself in a place where you get really frustrated, really upset, really uncomfortable. And then think about those habits that you want to get rid of. And if you link up enough uncomfort to them and enough pain to them, you won't ever want to do them again. It'll feel so ugly inside trying to even try to do them. It'll make you sick to your stomach. You'll be like, no, thanks, and walk away from it. So it's simply associating pain and pleasure. The way we talk about it is each day, write down your goal. Write down all the pleasurable outcomes and experiences you're going to get by achieving it. Write down all the negative consequences you're going to get if you don't take action now and literally keep stacking more and more on both sides. Uh, we always say keep it in like an 80, 20 or 70, 30 or 60, 40 ratio, meaning you've got like 80% positive, 
20% painful consequences. We use that where the positive is kind of like gasoline in a race car. And the negative is kind of like if you watch the movie Fast and the Furious, it's like Nas, that little nitrous oxide where you press the button, you're like, boom, you go flying. But you couldn't win a whole race just running on nitrous oxide. You blow up the engine. So it's like that's that like, bam, powerful kick to get you moving. And then the positive stuff is what keeps you going long term. Yeah, I, lo I love how you focus on some of the negative, and I, and I love it for a couple of different reasons. Not that it's the primary focus, but in the in the world of business, when I was leading teams before, I would do a post-mortem exercise where we act like we just failed at whatever goal we're trying to achieve, uh, and we put ourselves in that future state, and then we talk about what went wrong. So it's, it's almost like a reverse to your ideal exercise. Um, are there other things that you do with individuals in terms of those exercises that give people that jolt or shock them to give them that epiphany to wake up? Uh, tons. I mean, a, a lot of times what we do when working with individuals is just really raw, real conversations. Like, like I said, uh, it's measuring, measuring granularly. So we're watching what's going on. And if we get a day where we see your numbers in your health drop from a 10 to a six, you will get a WTF text from me. It's like, Hey, what the hell just happened? Why are your numbers down? Like what specifically caused it? One of the major things that we're still working on, which we don't have access to just yet, is closing that feedback loop. Because one major, major challenge we have is, like you said, people have quarterly meetings and monthly meetings and one-on-ones with their team. And the big challenge you have is, let's say they jacked up on the 15th of the month and they had a really shitty day and it messed up the, you know, the momentum for the month and you don't talk to them until the 30th or the first of next month. Well, you just had 15 days go by that now when they get disciplined for that one day that got screwed up, their brain, that's like taking a dog who just pooped on the front rug and waiting a month and then trying to like discipline him a month later. He has no clue what the heck he did wrong. Um, all he knows is he's getting punished and that doesn't feel good and, and whatever the heck, like that's just confusing. So what, what's wild is what we try to do is close the feedback loop as tight as possible. And right now we can do it within about 24 hours, ideally in the future with wearable technology, breath tracking, you know, meditation tracking, step tracking, sleep tracking, eventually calorie and food tracking stuff that'll come out. We'll be able to do it minute by minute where when we see your stats drop or you, we see you go into 30 minutes of tense breathing, we can, I can text you right there and be like, Hey, breathe. <laughs> um, which now we can give you exact feedback at exact moments when stuff like that's going on. That time sensitivity is so impactful. That's uh, that's incredible that you all are working toward that and closing that loop. That's incredible. Yeah, it's a game changer. I mean, the, the, the device we use right now, it's not perfect yet, but it's awesome. It, it's from a team at Stanford that that's tracking all the breathing patterns called Spire. Uh, it's not our device. We don't, we're not in a part of it, but we use it and it goes on someone's belt loop or bra strap and it tracks your breathing patterns. And they've been able to figure out through testing and studying that there's three different breath ratios people have. One is, um, tense and it's erratic breathing in, you know, so many breaths per minute. One is calm. It's smooth, consistent breathing with so many breaths per minute. And one is focused, which is slightly overlapping both calm and tense, but it's more a consistent rhythmic breath with a little bit more breaths per minute. And they can actually show you the difference, stick the little tracker on you, and and their app will actually track you all day and buzz you when you're in any of the modes and, and just either congratulate you or, or call you out on it. But from a coaching aspect, I would love, which they're working on right now, to have a dashboard where I can actually see how you're performing. Now, to take it granularly to someone who owns a restaurant or runs a kitchen, how cool would it be that if there was a screen off to the side that literally showed green, yellow, or red, or green, blue, or red on how well your team is breathing right now? And if you know something crazy happened and all of a sudden four of your chefs go into red, you can walk by and say, hey, everybody, like, come on, let's take a breath real quick. Let's breathe it out. Let's get back to calm and let's stay focused. Because here's what happens when they go into red, nervous system wise, they go into fight or flight. They're no longer operating at a cognitive func like high level of cognitive function. They're now in fight or flight in an animalistic mode where they're just responding to cues and whatever they've been taught, which is good and bad. The good news is if they went to a great school and they've really practiced, they'll produce some great work still. The bad news is if they have any bad habits, all of them are about to come out right now, including how they correspond with each other. And so in that moment, you could only imagine you got a screen that can tell you how the whole team's doing breath wise and state wise. You can manage the whole state of your team right there in the moment, which they're working on. 
That's incredible. I also feel like it could be great for, okay, you have to say the, the new guy is about to get buried and he starts to get stressed out and he's not really showing it physically, but inside he's starting to panic. He's starting to go fight or flight and you can kind of catch it before it gets too late. Yeah. I mean, you can get him as he starts to enter fight or flight. And what's funny is a lot of times we're totally unconscious of what sends us into these patterns. I remember I have mine on all the time. I have it right now. And I'm doing pretty good. I'm staying calm. Uh, but I remember one time I went downstairs. I was talking to my wife. And we were talking about a family member that was struggling and how we could possibly help them. And for some reason, we had a little bit of a disagreement on our approach. And all of a sudden, I got this weird buzz. And I looked down to see what it was. And it says, you've been tense for seven minutes. <laughs> I was like, wow, I didn't even know this was a subject that got under my skin. I yeah. felt like everything was fine. Like I literally felt like I was my best self. I literally felt like I was an A player. I'm doing great right now and everything's A-OK. -okay. And in reality, I was going into a tense state, which means now I'm reacting instead of responding. I'm not the best version of myself. So all that happened, all that changed is the realization of, wow, the next time we talk about this subject, I'm going to do really my best effort at consistently, calmly breathing through it to stay as my best self so that I'm making logical and intelligent decisions instead of emotional responses to the situation. And it was so much better the next time we talked about it. Yeah. And I think mean, that's something you talk about in the book, too, with with responding versus taking action. But to kind of stay on you for a minute, if we can get just a little bit personal, maybe what's something that you struggle with that you try to you know, coach in your clients that you have a tough time with every now and then? Um, let's see when we're on the road, I would say sleeping. That one can throw us a loop depending on where we are in the world. Like if we hop a flight and pop over to London, um, I try to sleep seven and a half to eight hours a night, according to researchers. And a friend of mine wrote a book on it called sleep smarter, uh, the best athletes in the world. So Usain Bolt, Serena Williams, Michael Phelps, Venus Williams, all these people, they sleep anywhere between like eight to 10 hours, eight to 12 hours a night. Uh, most of us tend to live with a mantra as a as young entrepreneurs of I'll sleep when I'm dead. And we tend to break ourselves down instead of build ourselves up consistently. And, and it deteriorates our health from the inside out. So one thing I've struggled with in the past is when we go from country to country, um, it gets a little tricky with time zones, really getting in that solid eight hours of sleep every night. So we, we buy tra trackers and measurements and, and devices to figure out how to do it. We've got some really cool stuff that we use now that really helps. Um, but a big, big, big factor that helped me a ton with that uh, was reading my friend Sean Stevenson's book, Sleep Smarter. Um, great read, great book. And it just it gave, it gave me 21 tips on how to improve my sleep quality every night. And, and so I've done it, and, and it's dramatically increased over time. Very cool. So talking about just struggles for a moment, uh, when you're coaching individuals, do you think that individuals struggle more with the accountability piece or that they don't have the right information? Ooh, depend, that, that's very person dependent. Okay. Uh, <laughs> both, depending <laughs> on who you're talking to. Uh, like if you don't have the right strategy, I don't care how well you execute, it's the wrong freaking strategy. And, and that's like, you know, taking a, a, a car with the sun, you know, the, the roof down driving through Denver right now. Like that's a bad idea. And, and even though it's a cool thing and in the summer, it's amazing. You pick the wrong month, you're going to freaking freeze. And, and that's that, that's just how it goes. So, if, so some people do literally just have the wrong strategy. Um, simple way to figure out if a strategy works or not Two: either a find someone else who's using that strategy. That's very similar to you and, and watch, <laughs> just step back and watch and observe if it's working or not. Um, the other piece though is, is testing and really truly my belief is I don't think everything works all the time. And the truth is, you know, some, everything works some of the time, but nothing works all the time. So I'm always paying attention to what works for me. Meaning I'm going to take what you tell me, like those 21 steps on sleep. I'm going to try them one by one. The ones that help me sleep better, I'm going to keep doing the ones that don't, they're gone. And there was a couple out of the 21 that I did. And I was like, that doesn't, that feels weird. I don't like it. So it's gone. And, and, and that concept of testing is really important. There's too many people at, at a younger stage of life who are so hungry to figure out what works. They just wait for someone to tell them the secret formula of life. And that, that's good because they're hungry and open to it. It's bad because if someone reads, you know, gives you the wrong strategy or gives you a strategy that doesn't work for you, now you're kind of screwed. 
And, and, and so test, 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 test. And, and that concept we're very, very um, aggressive on with all of our clients. And I'll tell them, I'm saying, hey, I know about five different strategies or more that we can do for this one topic, like time management. I know five different approaches we could take that are all proven. They all work for some people. And so let's start with this one because I think it's what'll work for you. But let's measure the next month and figure out if you get better or worse. If you get worse or stay the same, it's not working. Let's try a different one. If it gets better, let's keep doing it. Um, that concept is the easiest way to figure out what really works and, that, and to help them actually improve. How can that tie into you in the book? Also, you, you mentioned before, talk about the ideal day. And I, I'm pretty sure on the website, if it's still there, there is a chance for, for folks listening to download uh, the kit that can kind of help you get started to, sure. to start figure that out for yourself. But, you know, that's obviously says a lot about, you know, what our priorities should be maybe versus where our priorities are now, or at least where we're focusing our attention now. How do you wrestle with that tension if you're trying to maybe recalibrate your life? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so he, the, one big factor, and this is the easiest way to, when people are in, in alignment with what they value most, they tend to be happy. Meaning if you think you should be living a certain way and you are living that way, tend to be pretty satisfied with life. Um, you know, when you think you should be living away and you're not doing that, you tend to be kind of frustrated. And if you think there's no way you could possibly make it happen, you tend to be devastated or really upset. And, and so with that concept in mind, um, for, for, for most people taking time to sit down and write down what's most important to you in life and just answering that question and just repeat this, the thought to yourself, what's most important to me in life? What's really most important to me in life? Write down the first five to 10 things that come to mind. And then you got to next step is once you've done that, take out a calendar and look at your average week and just ask yourself a question. Am I living according to what's most important to me in life? Am I living in alignment with it? And I remember, I'll give you an example. I was, um, we did a cruise where we took a bunch of people with us on a big trip. It was really fun. Uh, and my cousin and had just been married and her husband was there with us. And when I asked the question the first time, he said, oh, done, easy. God, family, making a difference, success, health, and something else. I was like, cool, very cool. So, okay. A couple of days later, I waited and then I'm like, okay, pull out, a, pull out a calendar and write down what you actually do all day. And they all did it. And I was like, is it in alignment with the list you made two days ago? And I try to space it out so they, they can do the exercise and actually see. And he didn't say anything, but afterwards he came up and he said, hey, you know what I realized just right now? I was like, what? And he said, I tell myself that it's God, family, health, success in that order. He said, but the truth is when I look at what I do every day, I wake up thinking about the next deal I'm going to close in the business. I think about deals all day long, even when I'm sitting at the table with my family. And even at night when I'm sitting around, I'm constantly thinking about emails and deals closing and all this other stuff. He said, if I'm really honest, how I'm living right now is work is number one. And then everything else kind of falls underneath it in a big pile. I was like, wow. So he's telling himself and he believes that he's living in alignment with one list. But the truth is it's really one thing he's focused on and everything else is just kind of mixed up together underneath it. I was like, oof. And so one thing we did with him, was we sat down and had the question, which is the ideal day and said, listen, if you were going to live life in a way that completely aligned with what's most important to you and you were going to live life that was so rich, so fulfilling, so deep and meaningful, what would that day look like for you? How would you feel? Where would you go? What would you do? Who would be with you? What are all the factors that would play out? And we had him write it out. And we said, great. Now, based on that, does it align with your values? And he's like, absolutely. That's why it would be such an amazing day. He said, great. Well, how do we start to transition you? And there's two ways to do it. We can either just, you know, cut the rope and go right now and just say tomorrow starts the journey or we can make a, a nice gradual transition. I'm a big fan of the gradual transition because it makes logical sense unless you're in a dire position where you have to change tomorrow. But for most people, you know, I, I took a guy from, from a major bank who, who was not living true to what he thought he was supposed to be doing or in alignment with his values. And it took him about 13 months, I think, or 18 months. And, and we got him the transition out of the bank, started his own business, you know, bought a couple of houses, moved out to the Hamptons. And, and within so long, I remember so many months later, him, him calling me and being like, guess what? I just lived my perfect day that I wrote on paper back in the day when I was living in London years ago. Like, this is amazing. 
and and it was very cool uh, very because cool. he turned it into reality. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that, like gradual transition, but you have to know where you're going and you have to make sure that whatever you're transitioning to is really a fulfilling, rich, purpose-filled type of life that that brings the most out of every moment for you. And it's bigger than yourself. Exactly. So Jarek, when somebody is trying to make that change and they have bad habits form, bad rituals form, I think a lot of people have as a precursor sometimes to those habits are triggers. So, I mean, my example with me is I've got a refrigerator that has water on the side of it. And every time I go to get water, I don't care if I'm hungry or not, I open up the refrigerator. It's just a trigger. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. And I feel like triggers sometimes can cause people to act a certain way. How does a person break those either triggers and change those habits successfully to then start waking up and living that ideal day. Sure. So according to Mr. Duhigg, who is the researcher on this and all the teams over there, um, the, the whole concept is you, you never get rid of a bad habit, you replace it. And so the, the biggest challenge most people have is they try to stop a bad habit and the bad habit comes right back. Yeah, so true. <laughs> um, and, and, and so replace it. And this means consciously realize, like you realized, the trigger is walking over to the fridge to get some water or ice. Now, the routine is you open it up, you browse around, you look for something, maybe eat something, maybe you don't, but you just go through the routine. And then what's the reward is the other part you want to figure out, meaning what do you get from it? Mm -hmm. Now, once you figure that out, what you want to do is replace the routine in a way that still gives you the same reward. So let's say the reward is peace of mind. The reward is calmness. The reward is um, feeling better about them. I'll give you another example. So I had a little cousin and she was younger and she started smoking. I was like, that's interesting. She used to be a health nut. Like what the heck did she start smoking for? And, and all of a sudden I sent out a little video talking about this concept and one day she quit with, that's it. Just one day she quit. And I was like, wow, how'd you do that? She's like, oh, that video you sent out from our blog. And I was like, really? I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, I think highly of our work, but to, to help someone quit smoking in one day from one freaking five minute video is pretty cool. <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm gonna give myself a high five for that one. I said, but what happened? She goes, well, I figured out my trigger. My trigger was when work got too overwhelming, here was a trigger, overwhelm. I would, here's the routine. I would stand up, walk over to the door, go outside, stand outside, light up my cigarette, do my smoking, put it out, come back in five minutes later, sit back down. And I, and she goes, the reward was I would feel more relaxed. I would de-stress in that five minutes. I went, interesting. I said, well, what did you do? She goes, you know, I thought of more healthy options that I could replace it with while do, you know, that would still give me the same reward. So I said, what'd you do? He, she said, I would stand up, go over to the door, put my running shoes on and I would, for five minutes, take two laps around the building, then come back in, sit down, and be de-stressed. I was like, wow, holy moly. I'm like, is that easy? What about the nicotine and the addiction, all this stuff? She's like, ah, it's fooey. She's like, literally, I just gave myself something that felt the same, if not better than smoking did, without any of the side effects. And I changed it in a day, and I've never gone back. He's like, wow. So now anytime she feels stressed, she goes out and takes a jog. Very cool. How would you apply that, you, you taking a bad habit and replacing it with something that has the same reward? How would you apply that to if you're in a relationship with somebody and you, we all have our triggers, you know, our spouse or seeming other does this or that, and it triggers us and the natural response is to do whatever you do. How do you replace that type of behavior with, a reward? Is, is it looking at the long term and saying, all right, at the end of this conversation, I don't want to be on the opposite side of the room with this person. I really love them. So how does that work? Sure. Um, to keep it simple, let's say that your spouse has a habit that drives you insane and they realize that it drives you insane. And so in this moment, they can either choose to keep the habit or they can choose to light up and ignite in all the most beautiful ways and fill up their spouse. And so at that choice, is really up to the person. And some people, based on how they grew up, based on what they believe, they're like, I'm not changing me, so you're just gonna have to deal with it. And if you really love me, then you'll deal with all my crap. I don't tend to like that philosophy on life. I don't think it's gonna bode well long-term. I, I think at some point that'll drive a you know divide in the relationship because you're not thinking about the other person. You're being very selfish in that moment. Um, 
that's the way it rolls. Go for it. I'm not here to fight you. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, what, do you want your habit more? Or do you want your relationship? And I tend to put my relationship really high importance wise on the list of values for myself. And so I always say, Hey, I'm willing to kick a bad habit to make my wife feel loved and adored and cherished and understood and appreciated and acknowledged. And, and so for me, it's going, wow, I have a habit that's causing her not to feel those things. Therefore, I need to identify what the trigger is. I need to identify what the routine is. I need to come up with a new routine and I need to identify what the reward is of going through it. And just the same way we'd get rid of smoking or, or the refrigerator habit, same way we would replace it. But the biggest thing comes down to the realization and the decision that says, hey, what's more important, me having my habit or me having my spouse be really, really lit up, happy, fulfilled, and, and cherished and acknowledged and appreciated. Yeah. And I would like to say publicly that my spouse does nothing that annoys me. (laughs) Smart man. Smart man. (laughs) Uh, So question, you you help individuals in relationships. What's, in your opinion, what's a barrier to building a very solid, uh, lasting relationship that you see commonly with people? So one of the barriers that prevents people from doing that, uh, they go to a relationship to try to get something. Simplest way to screw it all up. Um, they go there to get love. They go there to get connection. They go there to get sex. They go there to get um, someone to tell them they look good. They go there for some reason, and they're trying to get something, love, appreciation, attention, companionship. They're trying to get something out of it, and that's their initial driver of why they're going there. And the challenge is when eventually they soak all of it out of the relationship, they have to go find it somewhere else now, and that generally is why they end at that moment because it's like, hey, I don't have any more of this. I can get out of this relationship. So great. Where can I get it from? I'm going to go there. And that's why you see some couples where they get together. Everything's amazing. Eventually they run out and now they get it from the kids or now they get it from their job or now they get it from some extracurricular hobby they have because it ran out in their spouse versus the opposite, which is, Hey, I'm choosing to first fill myself up as a human being, become full and abundant in who I am, happy, healthy, fulfilled, strong, abundant. Now from there, what is the gift I wish to share most with another human being on this planet that they would acknowledge and appreciate and they would want to experience from me? Now I'm going to go seek out someone who wants most to experience that and I'm going to figure out what I hope most to you know, that they would share with me. Now, from there, my focus is always to give that gift, never ending and always. And if I can always be focused on giving the gift, now, if it ever feels like it's falling apart, it only means I'm not giving that which I want to give. And therefore, I have to dig deeper and cause myself to give more of that gift. And as long as they acknowledge, appreciate and cherish that gift, which is important. You know, I coached a couple who was much older and the gift that he wanted to give to the world, she did not acknowledge or appreciate. And therefore, he felt very empty in that situation. It goes vice versa there. And so you want to find someone who actually appreciates the gift because this is the one thing as a man as we get older, the one thing we want to constantly be sharing and talking and thinking about. And we want someone who acknowledges that. And it, it goes both ways. Um, but, but that thought, if you can find what that gift is that you want to give most – and find someone who adores and appreciates that gift and acknowledges that gift and respects that gift, uh, you can have a great place because your whole life, your only goal will be give as much as humanly possible. Well, Jerry, Jer- thanks for your time. We just have a f- maybe a few more questions and we'll wrap, wrap things up. For you, what has been the most meaningful part of, of your journey over the last 10 years or so? How, how long have you been doing uh, the work you do now? Coaching, I think I'm on my 13th or 14th year of doing coaching. Um, we're seven, seven, almost eight years, no, seven years into, uh, our own business when we broke off on our own to do this. And, and it's awesome. Um, as far as you said, the most impactful part or yeah, impactful, meaningful, gratifying. Um, it, it's the same thing over and over again. And, and it's that moment we have a philosophy. Our main goal to know that we're successful every day is reaching one person that needs us most at the exact moment they need us. And we don't know where they are. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what's going on in the world. All we know is that our goal is something we put out, whether it's a tweet, an Instagram, a video, a Facebook live, a blog post, an email, something that's going to, you know, a speech we go do, a client we talk to, something our hope is we'll go out into the world and find that person who really deeply, truly needs it in that moment and somehow get through to them. And so the most impactful moments are usually – you know, the letters and notes we get from people saying, hey, 
Um, I remember one specifically young lady who was in the armed services. She had been deployed multiple times. She got home, was struggling with PTSD. And we got an email from her saying, Hey, um, I, I just want to say thank you. And I was like, okay. And I kept reading and it says, you know, I was deployed, had PTSD, came home, was really struggling, had multiple times where I had my firearm in my mouth thinking of pulling the trigger. And I ran across your book. A friend talked about it. I, I read it. Uh, I went through one of your other programs online and I just got to tell you, thank you. You saved my life and you, you helped me find my, my reason to live again. So thanks. And, and knowing, knowing that something we do and we get to call it business can actually save someone's life, I, th I think is the coolest success we could ever have. I agree 100%. Well, well, in closing, if you have any final thoughts on some kind of parting words that you would want to leave somebody with as we're wrapping up. Sure. Uh, probably just our philosophy we live by over here, which is learn it, live it, give it. And I always tell people, you know, figure out what you want in life. So design your ideal day, design your vision for what you want in your life. And, and, and step one is go learn what it takes to actually turn that vision into reality. Like learn the steps, learn the tools, read the books, take the classes, like learn what it takes to actually accomplish that goal Two, live it. Um, we wrote a book on this concept because so many people go out and learn stuff and never put it to use. So, so live it, actually apply 110% of what you learn and figure out what works for you and figure out how to do it your way and figure out how to crush it in all the right ways. And then at that point, once you feel like you've really kicked ass at life and you've done what you want to do and you are living true to who you believe you're supposed to be, please, at that moment, exact moment, don't wait, but pay it forward. You know, find a way to give it, find a way to say, hey, this is working for me. This isn't some five golden tenets of how to live life forever. This is like, this is my formula that works right now for me. If it changes, I will let you know. But right now it's working. And I please just want to offer it to you as an opportunity that if you see something in here that looks like gold to you, take it and run with it and, and, you know, bless you on your journey and just pay it forward to people around you to give them the opportunity to see other things that are working as options for them to grab onto. And hopefully it'll work for them too. I love it. And, and I think... Just, this is a great job with the book. It's so practical. You know, each of the chapters has the different exercises that a lot of people probably don't really think about or ask themselves or spend time with by themselves about. So I think you do a great job in the book of really giving people something tangible to really start working towards and thinking about. Thank you very much. We, we wanted to make it as an actionable as possible. So every chapter has live it actions, you know, live it challenges you can go do that are like, hey, I just told you a story about this. I told you why it's important write it down, like go do it now. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. want people to read the book and be like, well, that was a nice story. Like I want them to read it and have stuff on paper scribbled everywhere of their vision, their plan, how they're going to do it, what they're the steps they're taking, their action plans, their daily rituals. Like my hope is they leave with a journal filled of action plans and manuals to go out and do everything they really want to do with their life after that. So. Absolutely. Well, well thank you so much for your time. It's, it's been a pleasure and we look forward to chatting with you soon. Thank you guys. So that was our conversation with Jarek Robbins, and it was an absolute pleasure. Sean, what did you get out of the conversation? You know, one thing that fascinated me that I'm going to look into is that Spire breathing tool. Absolutely. You know, with me, I've tried to meditate before, and I feel like what he was saying about meditation was me to a T. I end up having a conversation with myself. I end up thinking it about work. I end up coming up with my to-do list. And then I get up and I think, okay, yeah, so I meditated. And then from there, I'm, I'm off and running. But that Spire tool is very interesting. I'm going to look at that. So that was number one. Number two, I love how he talked about doing exercises both in the positive and negative because I've done that with employees before. And it's very impactful. So I, I really enjoyed those two pieces. What about you, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of the conversation we talked about habits and, and really how that kind of all ties into creating success in your life with having the right kind of purpose in, in mind. And if you have the, the purpose that's kind of driving the bus, then you are really clear on the habits that you need to either eliminate or add, you know, to make your life better so you can start moving in the right direction. So, you know, I loved, you know, some of the really practical advice that he gave there and how we can really all do that if we have a more clear understanding of where it is that we want to go. So it was great to chat with him and you can link up with him over at his website, Jarek Robbins, which is J-A-I-R-E-K Robbins.com and find him over on social media with the same handle. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It would mean a lot to us if you leave a review over on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever it is that you consume your podcasts. Also, let Jarek know what you think. In closing, one final quote from Jarek himself. Every day is a new opportunity to make your life a story worth telling. Until next time, signing off. Signing off.